Hi, welcome to the Signal Path. In this episode, I have another product review for you guys. We'll be taking a look at the Roden Shores NGU401. Now, this is a four quadrant source and measure unit, and it represents the entry of Roden Shores into this domain, which is really quite exciting. It's built on some very nice hardware and software features. It is a six and a half digit grade instrument with 60 watt of output power, and you can go through its specification and see the detailed performance metrics. It does have some unique features, like the way they deal with how settling on the time and the voltage and the current work inside of the feedback circuits that are in there, as well as 500 kilo sample per second high-speed sampling. So there's a lot to talk about, including a teardown. So let's get started. And here's the front of the Roden Shores NGU-401 source measure unit. The design is going to look really familiar because now the industrial look of a lot of the power supplies Roden Shores bits are all going to be the same. On the left side, we have a common set of buttons again, the home menu, USB, and so on. This is now shared across all the units, as well as the GUI, which means a nice hardware software uniformity across all the devices. The LCD screen with the touch is nice, bright. The GUI is reasonably good and responsive, as we will see while we are using it. We have a rotation now with the selection and output enable as well here. In terms of the main unit interface, we have the sense ports. These are using the Roden Shores coloring scheme, plus and minus. This is a floating power supply, of course, with the sense ports accessible in the front, which is also quite nice. Then we have an earth loop here, allowing you to connect it to the negative terminal, which is shared here. This is something that you can remove if you don't want to have. That makes the power supply fully floating in that case, which is useful in some situations. And yeah, looks quite nice. Let's take a look at the back. And in the back of the instrument, we find a few additional useful ports as well. We have Ethernet, USB host and device, which are all routed to the front panel computer, of course. We have a digital I.O. here, which allows you to trigger and synchronize your measurements or stop and stop things in coordination with the NGU with other instrument, which is also quite handy as well. We can have an IEEE 488 interface for legacy support. This one doesn't have that populated. And all the front panel connectors for using uh, for the signaling is also available in the back. I don't believe there's a way to select between the front and the back connectors. I think they're just permanently connected to each other. This one also has an additional modulation plus and modulation minus port, allowing you to actually fully isolate it, modulate the output of this using a function generator or so. We will try that in some of our experiments, of course. Here's all the, where the, all the air comes out. When we do a teardown, we'll take a look and see what's on the other side. And of course, the power going in. Yep, pretty straightforward. So let's go ahead and take a brief look inside of this instrument. Now, as with a lot of Roden Shores instruments we have seen, the designs tend to be very efficient, very compact, and elegantly put together. Roden Shores often also goes above and beyond to make sure that the thermal solution in a particular product is really well thought out. So here we can see that they have wrapped around an aluminum case covering the heat sinks in the middle, trapping everything inside so that the airflow is really confined through the main heat sink that's underneath this. This obviously is extra expense, but they do this fairly regularly and it's quite nice to see. No turbulent airflow over places where there shouldn't be any well controlled. And this big fan that of course is responsible for the whole thing even sticks through the PCB at the bottom over there. This allows you to keep the height of the instrument under control as well. So air can just come from the sides and then go through this. And all the power devices responsible for the output is of course mounted to a heat sink underneath this. At the top we can see this extra PCB vertically mounted, and this is where the power comes in. It's conditioned, the voltage selection is done, filtered, and everything that needs to be before it goes on through here to the main transformer, which is underneath this. We will see it once we flip it over. There are a lot of big passives and capacitors underneath. This main PCB at the back actually ends right around this area, so it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't extend further back. We have a couple of Ethernet uh, ports and everything coming in, nothing unusual. These mounted Ethernet style ports on the PCB carrying over with an Ethernet cable is a very common thing that the Roger Shores does as well. Underneath here, you probably can't see, there's a Cyclone 2 Altera FPGA and a microchip microprocessor there handling all the interfaces between the front panel computer and everything else on there, basically controlling all the other analog devices over here. This is also a very common thing. As microprocessors and application processors became so cheap, uh, because of consumer electronics, more and more of the test and measurement vendors basically are creating a computer in the front panel of the instrument. We'll try and take a look at this a little bit as well. And that does everything, the GUI, worrying about all the signaling, all the processing, everything is there. It just communicates with the main board. And this therefore remains constant across a wide class of instrument, which is a cost reduction as well as kind of creating a uniform GUI design for everything, which is nice. Yeah, so really there's not much else going on over here. We should really look on the other side. 
And a few minor points I forgot to mention, you can see a connection here from this main board onto the main PCB. Now sometimes this is done in order to monitor the line frequency coming in, and this is useful to align some of the analog functions with that line frequency so that you can eliminate its effect, let's say, at the output. It could be for noise reduction, it could be for uh, aligning and monitoring and things like that. So you can see some of this over there. The power switch is mounted on the other side of this, and it's actually a hard power switch. So when you press this main front panel button, there's a rod that goes over here and switches it over there, which is quite nice because it looks like it's disconnecting most of the things from the line as well. Good earth on every side. We can see that it's well connected. All the capacitors are properly glued and so that they don't they're not susceptible to vibration a lot of strong mechanical contacts i mean this entire aluminum piece is custom made this in order to give the instrument rigidity this is very very heavy as we will see on the other side because of this transformer so they've thought about how to make sure that this whole thing doesn't twist and so on and eventually cause aging as time passes as always again to be expected from rodent shorts and here is the other side of the instrument, and now we can finally see the toroidal transformer. It is absolutely massive, really beautiful unit. These things are quite expensive in manufacturing, but they have a very well-defined magnetic field that wrap around the donut-shaped core of the transformer. Very nice when you want to confine the field in a very low-noise instrument like this one. And look at how many tabs it has. I don't think I've ever seen a toroidal transformer with this many tabs inside of a measurement instrument like this before. And again, this is a very road and shores thing. You can see all the tabs coming in. They're all individually fused. And we see this in some of the Keysight instruments too, protecting everything else, of course. Uh, there's a couple of MOS switches. It seems like high performance or high power, low resistance switches there across some of the very big capacitors on the other side or in series with them. And I think this might have to do with the voltage or current priority setting of the instrument. But I think they're using these switches on these capacitors to potentially dump a lot of charge from the capacitor onto the load, for example, in a current priority settings or so. That's just my guess looking at roughly how it is wired up. You can see the fan sticking through the PCB like I was talking about before. Here's the back of the FPGA as well as the microprocessor. You can see the footprint of the BGA is quite visible. And it looks, again, very nice. If there was one thing that I would criticize is not a big fan of routing the main output of the unit into the front panel using kind of soldered on connections. And I think they've done this because this is done after everything's put together. And you can see it's soldered from the top. There's a little bit of soldered flux residue there. Not a big fan of that. I like the connectorized version of these with the uh, gold plated connectors that let's say somebody like uh, Keatley uses as well. And this allows you to create a very nice connection and makes the serviceability a little bit better. But really I'm nitpicking just because I couldn't find anything else that I didn't really like. So in the front panel, we'll take a look a little bit as well. But yeah, you can see how simple the, simple, deceptively I should say, simple the instrument design is as most of the complex functions are carried out over here. All the digital stuff and all the analog high performance stuff is on a separate board. And here's a look in the front panel. You can see the main connectors coming in. This is the main output sense ports and everything. Again, soldered to the front panel here. Wireless module, main application processor over there, a couple of flash memories and so on, and the connection to the LCD. The battery for the real-time clock and keeping everything in check is basically a, a full computer. Nothing really unusual about it from that point of view. A connector here that's not used, perhaps from additional module that's not populated. But this is the same across a lot of different instruments now. It looks like we have a brand new hiding spot in order to attack unsuspecting lab technicians. And here's the Roden Shores NGU 401 powered on and ready to go. It takes about 10 seconds to boot, which is pretty good. Now I want to do a couple of experiments with it to get to know the instrument and we can play around with the various of its capabilities. Now I'm going to measure this device over here. This is a little circuit from one of these USB power banks. And the nice thing about a circuit like this is that it can actually take advantage of the multi-quadrant capability of a source measure unit like the one we have here. Because when it's connected to the battery, you can both charge the battery and sink energy from it. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to connect the terminals which are normally connected to lithium ion batteries. We're going to connect them to directly to the input and of the Roden Shores NGU. And then we can connect various devices to it and we can try to charge it. And you can get a lot of characteristics by using a source measure unit about how this device performs, both in terms of when does it cut off and how much power can it deliver to a battery, what kind of behavior does it have under load, and so on. So let's go ahead and hook this up and see what we can do. So the GUI distribution of the instrument is quite good. I like the way they have put the kind of information you would want to get at a quick glance. On the left side, we have all the auto-ranging of the voltage output. 
and all the different ranges of the current, going from 10 amp down to 10 micron, which is a huge dynamic range, of course. Now, at the bottom, you can see that we can set the source and the sync current of the SMU independently. This is really good, and not a lot of SMUs support this, allow you to set them asymmetrically. Right now, they're set to the same value. But if you're using something and you want to protect your device against a source or a sync condition, you can actually do that. And this is helpful. On the right side, we have all the statistics and various uh, items up here will light up if they're enabled, as we will see, and the channel configuration can be controlled. So let's go ahead and enable this at 3.7 volts and see what happens. Here we go. Now, as soon as I enable this, the auto ranging of the current goes to 1 milliamp, and you can see that it is drawing 0.3 milliamp at 3.7 volts. So this 0.3 milliamp is the idle current consumption of our board. There's nothing you can do about this to reduce it. This is essentially draining the battery at just over 1 milliwatt continuously. And this is why if you leave a power bank around, it's going to eventually discharge. And nothing's happening, of course, on this, and all the LEDs in the back are all turned off. Now, if I push this button, it's going to measure the amount of battery. Now, there is no battery, of course. It's going to estimate that from the voltage here. Let's see what happens. As soon as I press that, we get three LEDs out of four, which is not unusual. And we're now drawing 1.6 milliamp, and you can see the auto ranging has moved to 10. And once these LEDs turn off, it would go back to where it was. It should have it any second now. There it is. And what we can do is we can change the voltage and see what happens to that. So we can press that, you can enter the voltage if you want, or if you just go back, you get a little cursor, which I find really, really helpful. So let's go ahead and increase that to 4.2. If I press that again, you can see that we get the 4. And if I go back down while the lights are on, you can see that it goes back down. So it is indeed measuring the amount of battery left. Let's go ahead and add a load to our USB device here. This is going to be one of these USB loads, which uses a MOSFET and a potentiometer to draw a constant current from a USB port. So I'm going to go ahead and plug it into our device. Now keep in mind that the current that you're seeing on this display is from the point of view of the battery. That's how much current is being drawn from the battery if we were connected to our little USB board here. So let's go ahead and increase the current up until we draw maybe about an amp from our battery. Here we go, we're already at the 3 amp range. Let's keep going. And here we go, here's about 1 amp. So this is at 4.2 volts. Of course, as the battery discharges, the amount of current drawn from the battery would have to go up because it's using a DC-DC boost converter. Let's see if that works well. I'm going to go ahead and reduce the from 4.2 volts. There you go, here's a 4 volts. Let's go all the way to 3.5. You can see that we are now increased about 25% more current in order to be able to regulate constant 5 volt to our device that's drawing current. We can go back up to 4.2, and let's increase it until the device fails. There we go, 1.2 amp of current, 1.4, 1.6, and there you go, 2 amps. There it is, there it is. Now this is a failure condition. Now you can see, because we have such a fast update rate on this NGO, you can clearly see that the device is pulling constantly, trying to find out if the load has been removed, so that it can recover the regulation. On the device itself, we have blinking LEDs, meaning that you have overloaded it. I'm going to go and unplug it. As soon as we unplug this, we get back to the minimum amount of current. And if I reduce the load a little bit and plug it back in, we get back to the condition we were. So we can already get an idea of what happens to an overload condition using this SMU. So now let's try connecting a power source to our little USB board. And this will essentially try to charge the battery, and it will push the SMU into an opposite quadrant, forcing it to accept current. I'm going to do that simply by connecting a little USB charger directly onto this. So we're emulating the charging of the battery. Here we go. Now, as soon as I plug this in, you can see that the SMU switches into a sync current mode, and it's taking about 230 milliamps right now at 4.2 volts. It's just under 1 watt here. So it's absorbing 1 watt of power. Now, this is at 4.2 volts, so the batteries are essentially uh, completely charged. This is assuming a single set of batteries there. So let's go and change the voltage and see what happens to the current. So let's see what we can change it to. So we can go up, for example. Now, as soon as I go to 4.3 volts, look what happens. It cuts off the current completely. And that's the protection built into our little USB device so that the, it doesn't overcharge the batteries. And if you go back to 4.2, it doesn't do anything initially because it's got a bit of hysteresis. That's another interesting thing to characterize. When we go back down to 4.1, now it's taking 664 milliamps. Now, if I go down to 3.7, roughly somewhere in the middle of the battery, we can see that you have 837 milliamps is the maximum amount of current it's willing to push into a battery. That's how much you can charge, it's about 3 watts or so. If I continue reducing it, it will continue trying to do this. Now at some point the battery voltage will be too low. What will it do at that point? Look at that. It now goes into minus 77 milliamps. So at this point, 
It is trying to protect a battery that's severely discharged and trying to push very little current into it so that it can bring it up slowly in case there is some damage or there's a problem, it doesn't dump a whole bunch of power into it. As soon as it crosses back to where it used to be, you can see that it goes back to the normal amount of current. So we are getting a lot of information from the behavior of this little DC-DC converter just by doing these experiments. So what happens if we connect our load while the battery is charging? You can see what happens here. I'm going to plug it in right over here. Take a look. As soon as I plug it in, nothing at all happens. And this tells us yet again something else about this device. It does not provide any power to any device while it is charging, which is unfortunate. So it doesn't have any pass-through behavior where you can use your device while it's being charged. I'm going to go ahead and simply unplug our charging cable and look what happens to the current. As soon as I do that, it jumps back to the positive side and then the instrument immediately switches to the opposite quadrant. It's all seamless, of course. Now it's drawing current again because that's the current drawn by our load. Let's talk about high-speed sampling and auto-ranging. The Rodenshaw's NGU-401 is able to sample the voltage and the current up to 500 kilo samples per second, which is great if you want to see some transient effects, and we're going to do a separate experiment for that in just a second. But this does have some influence on how the instrument does auto-ranging. Take, for example, a circuit that consumes 100 milliamp, and every once in a while, it has a sharp pulse of current of 1 amp. Because you're sampling at such a high rate, the instrument can take that 1 amp into account and auto range based on that 1 amp being present. But that's not what you always want to do. Sometimes you just want to auto range on the average current so that you can have the highest dynamic range, the most number of digits under that particular auto range condition. So this instrument has the ability to allow you to adjust for how that auto ranging is done, which is super helpful. Not all instruments allow you to do this, and I've run into scenarios where you have some very unusual auto-ranging and some undesired effects, and this hopefully avoids that. Let's take a look and see what happens. And here we have a current consumption of 0.3 milliamp, which is from this circuit when it's sitting idle, and you can see the instrument has chosen the 1 milliamp auto-ranging situation, which is of course the smallest value you can choose in order to accommodate 0.3 milliamp, and this gives us the largest number of digits here. This is perfect, that's what we want. But let's go ahead and change the algorithms of the auto ranging a little bit. I'm going to go over here, which is the channel settings. I'm going to go down to the range setting over here. You can see that I have auto ranging enabled for both the voltage as well as the current. Now I can go further into the current menu and I can influence the way the auto ranging is behaving. So I can change its upshift approach. I'm putting it on stepwise as opposed to jumping to the highest value. But really, these threshold timings are the most important here. So the upshift threshold is 0.01 second. Let's change that to make it 100 times smaller. So we go at three zeros here, point, uh, 0, 0, 0, 0.001 second. So what we expect here is that if there are very short events, now they will influence the auto ranging. Let's go back. What do we see? Look at that. The ranging has now shifted to the 10 milliamp. Now every once in a while, it jumps to 1.6 milliamp, and the LEDs actually turn on. And that's because these really sharp events are forcing occasionally the range to switch back and forth. And that means that the current is briefly interrupted during the auto ranging, and that triggers the something inside of the circuit, and the LEDs turn on as if you're trying to measure probably some disruption in the algorithm, and so on. So you can see how important it is to be able to influence these algorithms for the auto ranging so that you can make good measurement with your devices. So I'm grateful that's included. So let's try the SMU with the Fluke 233. Now when this Fluke instrument originally came out, it had a flaw in its power supply design, which caused the batteries to constantly drain. It had to do with the fact that even though the instrument was turned off, it would draw some current and it would drain the battery. Now this is one of those instruments where the top of the unit can actually separate and it comes off and separates into two bars and allowing you to connect it remotely. So when they're separate from each other, it uses an RF connection. When they're close to each other, it uses that infrared. Right now, the bottom unit does not have any power. That's why the error signal is there. Let's go ahead and apply 4.5 volt, which is three batteries, to this and see what happens. Here we go. Now, as soon as we turn it on, it recognizes that there is battery in there, so it errors go away. But take a look at this here. Look at that. You can see that it has these pulses of current, and it's constantly drawing this from the batteries it will eventually completely drain the batteries and the batteries will begin to leak because it will discharge them far below where they are supposed to be. And this fundamental flaw was a big, big problem in the design of this instrument. You can also see the auto ranging has gone to 100 milliamp. So it's worthwhile trying to take a look and see what kind of current draw this thing actually has. If you go ahead and turn it on, 
You can see once the instrument is done, of course, the current draw goes a little bit higher, which is not surprising. It's supposed to do that. And if I go ahead and remove this, once it switches to the RF, you can see the power consumption goes high even more so, and this is magnetic. It can stick up there. So everything else works fine except for its standby power. Let's go ahead and see if we can capture that. And the instrument does have a graphical viewer built into it, and you can access that by going through the menu and bringing it up like so. And it will plot the current consumption and the voltage being applied. You can see those pulses appearing. Now, unfortunately, the graphical display is severely limited. You actually have no control over the horizontal axis, and you're stuck with whatever it can give you. Now, I really hope that they address this, because for a 500 kilo sample per second capable instrument, you really want to be able to look at that waveform directly on the unit and not have to export it outside. But in this situation, you do have to export it. Now, you can already see some interesting behavior. As soon as I enable the power, you can see that we have some pulses, and these pulses change with time. And it has to do with whatever is going on inside the DC-DC converter of the Fluke 233. It's not doing a very good job in terms of preserving battery, that's for sure. So let's go ahead and take a look at the fast lock capability and capture that on a USB device, and then we can export it into a, some other software on the computer and take a look at it. You can also access that by going into the menu over here and going onto the channel, and you have the fast log option. Now in the fast log option, you can choose where to save it and how fast to sample it and whether you want it on an individual triggered in event or not. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this on a USB and then we can maybe store it for about two or two and a half seconds and take a look at the waveform. And here's the waveform once it's plotted in MATLAB and you can see the complexity of what is happening at the power supply of the Fluke 233 and how much spikes of current is taking from the battery. So we can see some of these spikes are actually fairly large. They reach 16 milliamps and it seems to have two distinct sets of behavior. There's this periodic pulses that appear, and then every once in a while, about half a second or so, you get another burst again, which probably is checking something internally or making sure everything is connected. So this is obviously completely broken. And if they had tested this, they would have known, of course, before shipping this product. Now, if you go over here, and you can zoom in, of course, you can see all the different details. These are the individual pulses, and then there's this burst of activity again, and it quiets back down. So the ability to have very fast sample rate in an SMU at extremely high precision with so many digits that it gives you, gives you this massive dynamic range is very, very helpful. This current going in a negative direction at the bottom over here, I guess it's because of the ringing in the cables and the interconnects that I have. This is most likely because of that. It's not because of the actual instrument itself pushing current back into the SMU, for example. But yeah, looks very nice and you can see, hopefully appreciate the benefit of having very fast sampling. So next, let's take a look at some of the dynamic behavior of an SMU under various load conditions. Now here I have a DC-DC converter. This is a micro module from Linear Technology, and I'm able to connect it to a DC electronic load on the left side over here and apply various kinds of load, even dynamic loads that rapidly switch. And I want to see how the SMU handles this and what can we do from the SMU side in order to stress test the DC-DC converter. So here on the left, I have my DC electronic load. You can see all the way over there. This can create various kinds of load, particularly pulse loads and so on. So we'll be able to engage that. And I'm monitoring the various voltages and currents of the input and the output of the DC-DC converter. And all those signals are going to get analyzed with the Roden Schwarz RTO 2064 oscilloscope. So we have a nice setup over here, and we should be able to investigate some of these behavior. There are a few things worth mentioning here. Now, even though the cable coming from the SMU up here to the input of the DC-DC converter is very short, this is still an inductive load. So the voltage at this port and the voltage at this port are not quite the same. Now I'm monitoring the voltage directly at the input because I want to characterize this one. Nonetheless, you have to keep in mind that this inductive load is quite a bit of a challenge for an SMU under very high current conditions and under rapidly changing situations. I'm looking at the current, of course, over here with the active probe. And we will see some interesting behavior as a result of that. So let's see what we have here. On channel 1, I'm measuring the input current to the DC-DC converter. On channel 2, I have the input voltage to the DC-DC converter at the board level. And on channel 3, I have the voltage at the output of the converter. So this already tells us a lot. Right now, I have no current drawn from the DC-DC converter itself at its output. So this is the steady state idle situation. And even right now, you can see that the input current indeed has some ripple on it. And that ripple is coming from the switching behavior of the micromodule. And that is inducing a ripple on the input voltage as well, which is being measured by the oscilloscope. That ripple is fairly small, but it's sitting at an average of 20 volts. That's where I have the SMU sitting at. 
and the output on channel 3 is sitting nice and constant at 12 volts. And that's because these micro modules do a very good job at filtering and regulating the output, that's their job. So right now under no load, this is not a difficult situation. Let's apply a constant current load. So here is a 2 amp constant current load. There we go. So right away you can see the average input current of course goes up by quite a bit. That's to be expected because it has to provide now 24 watts at the output of the DC-DC converter. And we can go ahead and look at that a little bit closer now. And indeed the ripple has grown quite a bit. Now it's about 500 milliamp peak to peak and the input voltage ripple which is caused by the current has also increased a lot but the output voltage is nice and regulated, still constant at 12 volts. So this is not a very difficult situation for the SMU. Even though there is some ripple there, there isn't a very big change in the current, at least in, in the full scale here. So let's go ahead and change this and make it a little bit harder. Let's add a square wave load at 1 kilohertz that jumps between 0 amp and 2 amps back and forth at the rate of 1 kilohertz, which is quite fast. Here we go. So now the situation is quite a bit more complicated. So we have to zoom out a bit to see what's going on. There we go. You can trigger it a little bit better. There it is. So you're seeing both the rising and the falling because there's so much ripple on this. But now we have a major change at the, at the low side when there is no current being drawn from the DC-DC converter. We have a very low input current and on the high side we have a high input current. If I zoom in further in, in you can see that that influence is also present at the output. And there is indeed some ripple change at the output as well. That could be from noise coupling even just to the oscilloscope cables there. It's a difficult measurement to do and typically you have to do it differentially. But the SMU is dealing with this quite nicely. So let's change the output of the SMU live. Now what happens in that situation is because the DC-DC converter load is unchanged, if I change the output voltage of the SMU and lower it from 20 volts, the amount of current it needs to deliver to our little board is going to go up because the output load is constant on average. Let's go ahead and try that. So here's 20 volts, that's what we're looking at. Let's go 19, 18, 17, 16, and 15. And you can clearly see that at 15 volts, the amount of current that the DC-DC converter is going to demand from the SMU at this 1 kHz switching rate is now much higher during every cycle. And the SMU doesn't really have any issue doing that, of course, because it still has the constant load at the output. And you can see the fast rise and fall times that the SMU is able to provide in order to maintain the constant voltage. We see some noise over here. I'm going to investigate that a little bit further, but it's nice to see that this doesn't cause any issues. Now the Roden Shorts SMU also has an interesting feature which allows you to set the kind of output capacitance the unit presents to the device you're testing. This can be quite helpful because generally DC-DC converters and other kinds of load may have an input capacitance and you may want to know the current delivered to the load ignoring that capacitance. So the SMU can do this because it can de-embed that for you. So if you go over here and if you go under the capacitance mode, right now it's disabled, but you have three options, a low capacitance option, and a high capacitance option. Now, when it comes to a DC-DC converter like this one, setting that can have drastic effects on the kind of ripple the circuit experiences. DC-DC converters may not even be stable with some kind of output capacitance. So let's cycle through these three different modes and see what the effect is on the waveform. So here's our original waveform. Right now we have the output capacitance mode disabled. I'm going to first set it to the low capacitance mode and see what happens. Here we go, setting it now. So as you can see, there was a tiny bit of change in the input current ripple on the high side, but really not much of a difference. And that's probably because the output capacitance that I'm currently applying isn't that different from the capacitance already embedded on the board for the DC-DC converter. But let's go ahead and increase that. And now let's set it up to the high capacitance mode. Let's see what happens now. Now that is a major difference. This tells us something really important. It tells us that this circuit is getting closer to actually being unstable. And if you increase the amount of capacitance, you could run into a situation where the entire system becomes unstable. Let's see if we can push it hard enough to create some instability. So I made the load a bit more aggressive. Now it's jumping between 0 to 4 amps at the electronic load. And I changed the scale on the oscilloscope. So these waveforms are now sitting at 1, at, um, one amp per division, which is quite a bit more. Now I'm going to lower the input to the DCC converter. And that's going to force more current to be drawn at the input. And we are in high capacitance mode. Let's see what happens. Here's 19, 18, 17. Oh, it's breaking. 15, and there you go. It stops. So what happened was that the SMU actually has a feature that allows it to detect an unstable situation. This is very helpful because it prevents damage from being done. Let's see what the instrument is reporting now. 
and here is the SMU saying that an oscillation was detected and the output was disabled and the capacitance mode is disabled. Again, this is a very useful feature. I'm happy to see that it is implemented. There is also another way the Rodenshorst NGU allows you to influence the output behavior of the SMU. It gives you a current priority mode. Now all of these power supplies and SMUs have a lot of feedback mechanisms at the output in order to provide constant current or constant voltage depending on a widely and quickly varying load. The current priority mode on the SMU changes the time constant on the bipolar output drivers in order to give a higher priority to the current rather than the voltage. So in this setting, if you enable this setting, the SMU will try to hit the required current before hitting the required voltage. And if you disable it, you do it the other way around. So depending on the device you're using, you may want to operate in one of those modes. Now the capacitance mode is only supported when the current priority mode is not turned on. That's something to keep in mind. So all these are various ways of influencing how the SMU reacts to your load, of course. So we looked at what happens when we load our DC-DC converter with a rapidly changing current, like a square wave. But the more interesting test is what happens if the input to the DC-DC converter is rapidly changing and has noise or ripples or some kind of pulses of voltage on it. This is a really important test for a DC-DC converter because it tells you how the converter filters out any input noise and input ripple uh, to the output so that the output can be regulated in a very constant way. Now, in order to do that, the NGU would have to support some kind of an arbitrary waveform editor built into it, and it does exactly that. And it has some very nice features. So let's go over here under the menu. You can see we have an arbitrary waveform editor. And in here, once you enter it, you can enter a sequence of voltages that the arbitrary waveform generator will jump between. And you can set how long it pauses on each one. Now, you'd be surprised, but it can support as small as 100 microseconds or 0.1 millisecond. So you can pause on any given voltage for as little as only 0.1 millisecond before jumping to the next one, which is very helpful and it causes a lot of high frequency ripple and high frequency noise at the input of whatever you want to measure, so you can really stress test it. Now I made a very simple waveform over here. Let me go ahead and load that one. And this is a simple case where we jump from 15 volts to 20 volts and we're pausing 10 milliseconds on each one. And now there's a triggering system built into this and you can run this once and you can run it uh, cyclically. You can see that I have a repetition rate of infinite. So it's just going to jump between 15 and 20, pausing on each one for 10 milliseconds. This is a difficult situation for the DC-DC converter. And let's see what it does. And to enable that, simply under the channel one settings, we have an arbitrary option and we can load the file. I've already loaded it. And once you have it in there, you can just uh, enable it. And there's a couple of additional options in here, which is the repetition rate, when to start triggering, when to stop triggering, or when to step the triggering. So you can synchronize the different points in your list also with a step external triggering system, which can be quite helpful so that you can synchronize this instrument with some other test and measurement unit you may have in some automation case. So I'm going to enable that. Oops, not twice, just once. There it is. So now, as soon as I enable the output, it's going to do this. Let's see what it looks like, actually. There you go. There it is. So it's changing back and forth very rapidly. So what we're seeing is the average voltage of about 17 and a half volts, but the output is changing. We're going to see that on the oscilloscope. So here we have the DC-DC converter loaded with a constant current of 1.5 amps, but the input is now changing by the SMU. The input jumps from 20 volts to 15 volts every 10 millisecond, like we set it in the arbitrary waveform editor. And if you look at the current, there is a constant current on average being drawn but it also changes up and down depending on the input voltage, of course. That's expected. But we should zoom in to see some of the interesting behavior of the DC-DC converter here. So if you zoom in far enough, you can see that when the input goes from 15 volts to 20, there's a reasonably nice rise time. There's a little bit of ripple on it and the rise time, but it's fairly well regulated. And there is a burst of current being drawn from the SMU momentarily. And that's to charge all the input capacitances and so on of the DC-DC converter board. The current then goes up briefly and comes back down and it settles on average in a lower place than it started. That's because the input to the SMU is now higher, therefore it needs less average current at the input. But the output doesn't remain perfectly regulated. The output is right now on an AC coupled mode, 100 millivolt per division, so you can see there is no AC noise on it, a little bit of ripple on it, and then there's a burst, and this is, corresponds to that input, so it can't fully filter it out. These are all very interesting information about the characteristic of the DC-DC converter. And the NGU has a lot of built-in functions and then minor adjustments you can make to it. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into all of those, but I did want to give you a brief overview. So at the back of the instrument, we also have a whole bunch of IOs, and those IOs can be used 
output to trigger something outside of the unit or can be used as inputs to trigger various functions of the instrument. For example, turning the output on and off or stepping through different arbitrary waveforms that can be created as we saw earlier. Now under the channel settings itself, we also do have the modulation input. The modulation input is an analog port in the back of the unit, which is fully isolated from the output. And by applying an analog voltage or a sequence of voltages, you can control the output directly with it. So basically you can use the SMU like an amplifier, like a high power amplifier. And because it has about a kilohertz of bandwidth, you can even measure frequency response using it. can be quite handy uh, it, because it to, to create some kind of an amplifier that can provide several amps of current and have a kilohertz of bandwidth is not something that's very common. You can also control things like over voltage protection, over current protection, and so on. There's also a fast transient response mode, which reduces the settling time from about 100 microseconds down to 20. So for example, if you're drawing a lot of current from the SMU and you want to make sure that the voltage of the SMU settles very quickly, you can turn on the fast transient response. The reason you would want to turn it off is sometimes you may cause into uh, ringing or, or instability, and that way you have control over that. And the opposite of that is, of course, rise and fall time control. That's also built into it. If I can grab this. So there's a ramp control built into this. And this allows you to limit how fast the output can change. This is good to test in a, uh, some kind of a device to make sure that it can handle a slow rise at the input or again to avoid some kind of ringing. All these features are firmware based and because the hardware is essentially there to do a lot of different things, by changing the firmware you can constantly add features to it. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this detailed review of the Roden Shores NGU401. The hardware is really quite nice, and the firmware could use some additional functions and features to be added to it, especially in the plotting and taking advantage of the 500 kilo sample per second right on the instrument, so you don't have to take data in and out, and some software interface to the unit on the PC would also be quite nice. As always, I hope that you learned something from this review and that you can find out if this fits within your applications. If you did and you do end up purchasing this because of this review, please let Rotten Shores know. It always helps the channel, allows me to bring the latest and the greatest to you and demonstrate them and tear them out for you guys here. So, as always, I'll see you in the comment section.